Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of Just Getting Started right here on Westwood One Podcast. I am your humble host, Rich Eisen. We've had a great run over the first month plus of this podcast. Matthew McConaughey and Damon John, Soledad O'Brien, last couple have been phenomenal all over the map, if you will, pop culture and obviously real life with Harlan Coben and Dr. Anthony Fauci. If you have not heard any of those episodes, please do us a favor, download them and listen to it after you've listened to this one with the one and only Gary Vaynerchuk. If you've never heard Gary talk, you clearly have never been on Instagram or Twitter or any social media. And uh, if you have heard Gary talk, if you do know what Gary's all about, well, here's the deal. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. You're going to learn a lot about what we are trying to accomplish here together, you and I, on this podcast, Just Getting Started, about figuring your way through life that has been turned maybe upside down over the last year. Figuring out a way to follow your dreams. Figuring out a way to put aside any concerns you have over trying something new or even, yes, succeeding at it. This is right in Gary Vaynerchuk's wheelhouse. He is an entrepreneur. He is somebody who has been all over as an angel investor in pretty much every company you've ever heard of. He owns his own media company. He owns his own sports agency, his own wine company. I could go on and on. Joining us here on Just Getting Started is uh, somebody who I'm thrilled to be able to call a friend, uh, someone I've known for quite some time, and uh, and then when I met him, I felt like I'd known him for even longer. He is none other than best-selling author and owner of uh, many different ventures, including Vayner Media, of which I just want everyone to know I'm part of as well. Gary Vaynerchuk, how are you, Gary? I'm well, Rich. Thanks for uh, having me on. You bet. Thanks for doing this. So. Uh, you're perfect uh, as a, for a guest for this, Gary, not just because you're on many podcasts, but this podcast is about people's origin stories and, and how <clears throat> folks can glean something, take something portable from somebody's beginnings. And you also, uh, in your remarkable social media platforms, give so much terrific advice to so many people who clearly need it right now. So let's, I guess, get started with, with how you got started. Is it as simple as you getting started with just being a kid in your household? When did you know that you had some sort of ability to uh, figure out business, business and yeah. go go from there, Gary? You know, I was a Soviet immigrant that uh, first came to Queens, very humble beginnings, you know, seven, eight family members in a studio apartment in Queens. Then we moved for two years to Dover, New Jersey, uh, and then pretty quickly we moved to Edison, New Jersey, where my real childhood happened very quickly in the first couple of months of being in Edison, New Jersey. I became a Jets fan nice. uh, within the first year of being in Edison, New Jersey, that first summer, because I moved in very, very late August, right before my first grade school year. And by that first grade summer, so call it nine months later, eight months later, I was very active that first, in between first to second grade summer, which just seems crazy. My, my little guy's in second grade. But, you know, I was very real about lemonade stands. I was very real about, you know, ring. I mean, I mean, I was really out there. I would find like a t-shirt or like a pen in my parents' house and literally go outside. You know, I'm an 80s baby. So just walking out of the house at 3.30 in the afternoon after finding something in the living room or in a drawer, and then just ringing people's doorbells in the neighborhood seemed very normal. You know, by today's standards, kids aren't allowed to go outside. So, yes. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I, I definitely did things, six, seven, eight, nine, sh- you know, snowstorm comes, shovel snow for five bucks or a dollar or a quarter, um, l- wash cars, which I don't think is a very super common kid thing, but like literally hose, buckets, you know, soap, ding dong, can we get three bucks to wash your car? I did a lot of that. And then probably by nine, 10, 
1985. Probably Gi- Giants won the Super Bowl in 86. 11. Uh, 86. 11 is when I probably was like, I'm a business man <laughs> or kid. Really? Like, uh, yeah, because 86, Giants winning the Super Bowl, I remember McCockney, uh, that right the, off the tip, yeah, off the Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. I remember yeah. that. I remember that play very vividly because I remember drawing a version of it in study hall the next day, <laughs> that Monday, and trying to sell that picture for 50 cents. And I remember that being the era where like the thought of business, and that's when baseball cards really started to hit the first time right. uh, in my life. And you know, that's they say. And then the following year, at uh, between 11 and 12 years old, I was literally going to baseball card shows and making deals, buying and selling with grown men. So, you know, it was very quick there in that five, six year, four, five, six year period in the early 80s, mid 80s, New Jersey. Just, you know, I probably deep down feel like I'll probably make like a Bronx Tale like movie about my life one day. Sure. And I and that will be the year I probably most focus on, the early 80s, wonder years, my version of it. And that's, so that's when I remember, that was my origin of like, I'm a business person and these bad grades are gonna be okay because it's not good. I know the world's telling me I'm gonna be a loser, but I don't believe them because I'm good at this thing and that seems real to the grownups and I'm gonna be okay. So where did you get that from? Where did you get that, I guess, want to or drive DNA, this? DNA. You know, I think, you know, my father's an entrepreneur. My Both my grandfathers spent time in jail in Russia. You know, very cliche, very common to be Jewish in the Soviet Union and find yourself in jail because the whole country was run by the black market. Anti-Semitism was ingrained in Eastern European culture. Um, and this was post, you know, my grandfathers were rolling the streets post World War II were a lot of blame. And so, you know, they were very entrepreneurial. You know, I heard stories from uncles and people that came from the old country. And so, DNA, it's not like I read a book or, had, right. or watched a Gary Vee video on Instagram. You know, <laughs> right. this was just like my chemicals, like no different than I'm sure somebody picking up a basketball or, or picking up a microphone and singing or just starting to draw. I yearned for the idea of hard manual labor. I, I liked work. I, I still to this day feel that I probably slightly overwork. I mean, even right now, right? It's 10 p.m. on the East Coast <laughs> when yeah, I'm recording this that. with you. Yes. You know, I admire you and like you and want to really support this project, but it's just still in me at this point that work ethic is a variable. I, I've gone away from a lot of my early content talking about the variables of hard work because I called it hustle. I think hustle in modern times, the last two, three years, has been manipulated into meaning something negative, which is overworking yourself and getting anxious. And so I've tried to be more thoughtful of using the word work ethic. But to this day, I struggle in in thinking about how one achieves things that they want to achieve without a real commitment to work ethic. I do think it's a lot easier when you love it. Right. Um, but I, you know, I, I definitely have always felt my chemicals make me want to put in that work. And it's obviously very difficult to manufacture that, but there are some people out there, and again, I, I, I'm a follower of everything that you say, like so many other millions of people, Gary, and I do see that you know, you do give very unvarnished uh, advice to people who are wondering how do they get to where you are. Again, that you're a kid from New Jersey who did have something born in you, but it does seem like that there is some sort of uh, brainwave that you have that people feel they can tap into. Is, is there something there is to that, some, Gary, do you think I, or no? I, I do, which feels weird to say I do. But now as I'm older, I'm like, wow, I have a lot of off the beaten path variables. I had an immigrant mother who had two other younger children than me, who grew up in the Soviet Union, who, you know, punished me every report card 
but didn't push me like every other immigrant parent that like grades were the only way out and celebrated my accomplishments you know early on in athletics because I was the best baseball player in third grade but by sixth grade <laughs> spe- spe- by six that was a tough one by the way talk about you know why I love sports it teaches you real quick literally all-star starting pitcher in 10 at 10 years old and by 13 retired because You're you know up. listen yeah. you know speed I don't know if you know this but as things progress rich speed athleticism strength and power all start to play hand eye coordination and grit determination and deep knowledge got me to legendary status <laughs> up to about right on the cusp of double digits 8 9 10 hall of fame bound but then those other variables that I still wish weren't variables mm-hmm. uh, took over. But um, I was in a co- Rich, I'll give you the answer. I was in a cocoon. And I think what I'm replicating with my content is really an homage to my mom. She created an insular framework of mentality for me that makes me feel unbeatable. I, you know, I often say... I'm working on a new book that will come out in the winter and it's, it talks about the emotional ingredients for success and happiness that I, from one man's humble, subjective point of view along the way, and I think it rears its head more in business than people think. And I think, by the way, I think it rears its head in sports. I do not think that organizations get lucky. Like, I think there's a reason if you look at 50, 60 year windows, there's orgs that do better than others. Yes. I think it, uh, and, and it gives me great confidence once I take over our jets, Rich, that I will be able to bring this to the table. So make sure you're hungry, you know, you, you're healthy and, you know, because I'm a, I'm a turtle, it's gonna take me some time, but once I get there, we'll get to work. But anyway, um, she created a cocoon. I never struggled with peer pressure. I never struggled with self-esteem. I was always kind. I really loved people. I did the right thing. I had the right intent. I put in the work. I had humility and accountability, uh, but I had ambition and confidence and I had all these things and, and the world was small. It was me and my family. I loved everything that was going on around me, but it carried no weight. My teachers say I'm gonna be a loser, which many did. It was a less political correct world in the 80s. It didn't bother me. My friends wanted me to drink alcohol and I knew my mom would be upset if I did. And they said, well, you're not gonna be popular if you don't, didn't bother me. Like nothing could ever penetrate my dome. And in a lot of ways, when I look and separate myself from my content, I'm like, huh, I'm just trying to create this little world, this small little pebble on the internet where people can come and have a conversation with me around perspective that has treated me and not just me, when I really look under the hood of the people that I admire who are happy, and that's a huge word for me, Rich. I think one of my great hopes is before I'm done as somebody who people are attracted to the way I communicate, as I continue to build, you know, one of the things I sometimes am disappointed about is that I love business and that I'm good at it and that what seems to be at the forefront is this entrepreneurial success when I have this incredible passion to change the narrative of success and focus it on being content and happy and building a legacy and being admired and appreciated for your actions, not your accomplishments. And and that's what I think my mom and dad did for me. And I kind of almost feel this version of guilt and gratitude to give it back. What you're seeing is the manifestation of an incredibly self-aware individual who realizes everything that people cheer for is more of me being the byproduct of DNA and parenting and circumstance. And what that does is it actually makes me quite humble. What I mean by that is when I get love and I get a lot of it and I get all this cheering, the way my brain hears it is great job, Sasha and Tamara Vaynerchuk. You know, like great job, the American dream. You know, great job. Uh, you know, accountability and not entitlement. Great job not spoiling kids. Like, I don't hear it. Like, I'm like, what did I do? Like, to me, when VaynerMedia gets daps, when like my doodling, when people are like, oh, you can, you know, I'm starting to doodle a little bit. Like, when that feels, I don't know why that feels like I, but like, when people say, you, Gary, are great, you are special, you've done shit, I'm like, my brain just goes, just so proud of my parents. 
Today's episode of Just Getting Started is brought to you by NetSuite. If you're a business owner, you might be making running your business harder on yourself than necessary. Stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it. And ditch the spreadsheets and all the old software you've outgrown. Now is the time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more. Everything you need all in one place instantaneously. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in revenue, save time and money with NetSuite. Join the over 24,000 companies using NetSuite right now. Let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour at netsuite.com slash eisen. So schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash eisen. That's netsuite.com slash E-I-S-E-N. Now let's get back to Gary V. I hear you too, Gary, you know, because I, I, I think of my folks quite a bit whenever I'm doing something, you know, um, on TV or succeeding. And I don't like, you know, smelling my own shit, to be honest with you. You know what I mean? Like, it, 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 you can really get bogged down in that sort of stuff. And, and, and the one thing I'll, I'll share with you, Gary, you know, when I remember when we first met, I met, you know, with you and your mm-hmm. brother and, um, Reed Bergman, who's been mm-hmm. my guy for a long time and is now part of your yep. Vayner Media world. And this was at the draft in Dallas and we had breakfast and, you know, I learned real quick how you're, you're, you're so lightning fast in breaking down a situation and boiling it down into the emotional language that someone can understand where you told me to own my own show. And you told me you got to own your own stuff. And, and, you know, I, I, I kind of knew that, but hearing it from you kind of crystallized it for me. And the thing that really hit me is you told you like, you, you know, you got kids, you got a mortgage. It's, it, it'll take some guts for you to basically just, you know, stop doing what you're doing. You know, all, all you guys mm-hmm. on TV, you know, you got your yep. contracts and, but you got your mortgage. It's going to take some tough. I don't, I don't expect you to do it. Like, but you kind of talked my language, like right on the spot. And I, you know, I respected that because you and I just met, you know what I mean? And it's just, I, I, I guess the simple question, how do you do that? I mean, so many people, how, how do you, how do you, because I think that's what so many people respect about your, your, you know, your, your work and how you say it. And obviously when you're, you're talking to people in person, pre-pandemic yeah. and, looking forward to post pandemic. That's what yeah. people react to. How do, how do you do that, Gary? I, you know? I was, I was gifted with empathy. It's how my brain works. I sit down and I listen, you know, it's so funny. I'm such a loud mouth that it makes me laugh when people, you know, there's nothing more fun than being misunderstood on first take. And I have all the elements. I, I actually, Rich, sometimes ask myself if I self sabotage cause I like being underestimated. I, this is a real, we're going a little therapy session here. Sure. I go to myself, am I a little over the top because it allows people to think I'm just a blowhard because I so enjoy the unveiling of like, ta-da, I'm not full of shit, I got the chops, or I'm, 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 you know, I'm not ego, I'm humility. Like when, you know, I enjoy as people get to, you know, what feels better than knowing that the people that know you the best admire you the most? What's better than that? Nothing. Right? When when Sally Pants 97 says I'm a jerk because I said Patrick Ewing is better than David Robinson on your show, <laughs> yes. or, you know, like, that's, you know, I don't like that because I want to be friends with everybody and I wish they understood the context of the, like, kind of like the slide jokeness of it all. But I'm okay with that because we don't know each other. If my cousin Bobby said I was a piece of shit behind my back, that's devastating. Hmm. Um, to answer your question, it's empathy. I really, I thank you. I mean, I started a wine brand, had a very successful business that I sold to Constellation Brands with my with two former interns. Think about how that feels where I'm getting to the gray hairs where I can take interns to being multi-million dollar partners. You know, um, I named that, you know, my life's work was the wine brand. I called it Empathy because I realized and I really appreciate you telling that story and the way you asked that question, the authenticity behind it. 
it's a fucking gift. I'm, I, I, I'm so grateful for it. It's so nice. It feels nice to me. I'm like, thank God. Like, I meet a person and immediately my brain goes into, what can I do for that person? How can I help that person? You know, let me listen to that person. And, you know, it makes people laugh sometimes when I go on podcasts and go a little deeper. They're like, this fucking guy, you don't listen. Because on my own podcast and even on your, I interrupt. I'm fat, you know, my brain it breaks a little bit. I go too fast. I get too excited. I'm always anxious about running out of time. I enjoy it. I like banter more than interview. I like, you know, like, like the, like hanging with your boys at dinner, you know, yelling about his Bud Webb better than Muggsy Bogues. That's my jam. So it doesn't always play in a podcast where you're supposed to play a little bit back and forth. So people think I interrupt and I don't listen. What they don't realize is I listen so much that I don't even need the per- this is so unreal to say it. I've never really said this this blatantly. I don't even need people to talk, Rich. I believe in psychics and all sorts of weird shit. Yeah. Not because I believe in it actually because I kind of like don't, but I have to believe in it because I almost know what somebody's going to say almost every time like I already know. If I'm uh- in it with them, I'm like I know, I know and that's why I'll go and I appreciate I man, I love you. You're right. I remember it now too very vividly. I go to, people talk baloney, like Rich, you can do it, you're gonna make millions. I go into, Rich, you have a guaranteed salary that I'm sure you and your wife and kids, you're living your lifestyle, like I'm empathetic. I'm not, you know, and so I get very practical, but I'm also ambitious and optimistic. So that level of practicality along with ambition and optimism is a very unique juxtaposition of pulling at opposite sides, which creates a little bit of a different variable and then you've got a highly intoxicating communicator spitting it and it creates this different kind of enigma. And it's, it is something that is, you know, I'm, I'm hoping people will hear this and can take it in and maybe use it in their lives too. Um, and that's, that, that's what I want. Well, let's talk about that for a second, Rich, because sure. I want to do that too instead of just like, who are you, Gary, right? So one thing that I definitely was portraying I'm sure in that meeting, because now I'm really recalling it pretty well too. I also like thinking about downside. So let's help everybody here, Rich. When someone's 22 years old, they're like, hey, I want to become an ESPN announcer, or I want to be on Barstool, or I want to start Facebook, or I want to, whatever. And you got 70% of people under 18 wanting to be an influencer or YouTuber at this point, which is self-employment around your own personality. One thing I remind people is, that's exactly what you should be doing at 21 to 27. Yet, your parents and the world and the system is telling you to get a job and now it's time to grow up. Meanwhile, you know this, Rich, both you and I are old enough now, we're still youngsters, thank God, but we're, we're enough in our lives that realize, you know, 21 to 27 is a good time to do risky behavior. You don't have kids. You're most likely not married. If you really have a big ass dream, you are willing to sleep on your buddy's couch with six other people and living like fucking pigs. Your body is more capable of eating dog shit food for 50 cents a meal. It's actually logical to be high risk, high reward, see the world if you're hip deed out or if you're curious or you're a photographer want to see everything. Start two companies, try to become you know, the next Rich Eisen or the next Mark Zuckerberg or Sarah Blakely. And the whole world tells you at 22, you just went from being a complete belligerent maniac in college to hard turn, be a fucking responsible grown, it's crazy. And then there's another layer, which is there's a lot of parents who wanna subsidize their kids post-college financially, which leads to a very unhealthy resentment and like, wild, I mean, one of the scariest things to me, Rich, is parents paying for kids at 22 and beyond. For both parties, parents have underlining resentment if you really poke and prod, and kids start to feel like they can't do it without their parents' help, and they become entitled. So for me, my big dream, one man's humble point of view, is 22 to 27 is very high risk, but hey, kid, you gotta eat the shit with it. You can't be high risk and mommy and daddy's buying Equinox memberships, Uber drivers, and like you've got a fancy fucking apartment. Like, I think if you can get to that place where you're 22 to 28, high risk, but you're on your own two feet and whatever that is, right. there's something very healthy there. Those, you know, so that's, that's a version of what we talked about, which is like truth, practicality, 
and looking at a situation slightly different than the conventional wisdom right now, which also is what leads me into not being a fan of college for everyone and not being a fan of college for a lot of people. Not just like the random person or two. I'm not talking about Zion Williamson or Mark Zuckerberg. I'm talking about if you're a kid and you're gonna go into $65,000 into debt with a piece of paper that doesn't get you anything in 2025 because the world's moving too fast for the university and, and schooling system in America, these are new conversations that we have to have. We have kids right now who are playing video games at 12 and 13 who should be playing more video games, not less, because they can become professionals. Yes. You know, so like, there's different things going on and, and parents almost always come from a place of fear, Rich. Almost always, because they love their kids. And fear, and I'm gonna use Rich Eisen terms here, fear is mm. prevent defense. And I don't like prevent defense, Rich. Especially I hate it now too. With, Especially now with all the offensive rules in the NFL, you're dead. You're dead. Well, I, you know, I, and I had the novelist uh, Harlan Coben on a couple shows ago, Gary, and we talked about fear being a blockade for a lot of people trying for that dream, trying for the swing for the fence when they're not maybe age 21 to 27, when they're a little later on in life, that even fear of obviously failure, but sometimes fear of what next, if there is success, how do you follow it up? What do you do to keep going? So what, what advice do you do? Or let's start with this. Yeah. Do you think the fear of that there's a fear of success that people might have that you could counsel them on? Or you just think that's a whole bunch of man. I got it. No, 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 no. I think the reverse. I think I actually have an incredible fascination with fear. Two reasons. One, the version that you just brought out really tickles my fancy because it's completely predicated almost always on other people's opinions, which drives me crazy. Like you're gonna really live your life, you've, you've won the 400 trillion to one lottery of having a human life. And now you're telling me with this miracle, and miracle, I'm not talking Doug Flutie, Boston College, Rich. I'm talking a real miracle. Like, and you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna listen to your neighbor who's gonna make fun of you if you have to move out of the town because your dream failed and you have to live in a shittier house. You're gonna listen to your mom, your best friend, your spouse even, which is the intimate relationship. Like, you can't. You're gonna have resentment. You You can't let other people's opinions have so much weight. You have to be compassionate. You have responsibilities. That's a different thing. I'm talking about opinions. If I lose, my dad's gonna be like, see, fucking knucklehead always was a knucklehead. Like, fuck that shit. That's one. Number two, there's a different thing that I think about with fear. I despise leaders that lead with fear because it's extremely effective. And I think it's short-term effective. And so when I think about coaches, political leaders, and a whole lot of where I see it, businesses, Mm -hmm. where the boss or the manager or the owner leads with fear. Cult of personality sort of thing yeah yeah and 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 by the way both versions obviously we've had the extreme versions in politics and sports where we've seen it really go awry but even just like subtle things like uh, you know what's so funny though the uh, over the top versions like a like a bobby knight right Hmm. that plays with me differently believe it or not because it's so transparent the one that i really struggle with is the ones that are cute about it like you know you have an employee you take advantage of and you can see they're about, you hear whispers that they're about to ask for a raise and you say things like, you know, we're gonna have to cut some people's jobs this week just on the way to the coffee. What you're, you, see what's, you see where I'm going, Rich? Fear. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I'm very visceral to fear. I fucking hate fear. I hate it. I hate it and I hate the word hate but fear fucks with me. It does a lot of bad and it, I do believe that fear There's two words that I think will change a lot before you and I die, hopefully in 60 years. I believe that fear will be rethought and talked about differently, and I think intuition, Rich, will be, which maybe is a good thing to talk about in tandem. I think we have gone through a very scholarly, stay in a box, black and white century, and what we're seeing right now with all the disruption, Rich, in the last 12, 15 years, I think we're going into a different era of gray, not the obvious, emotional intelligence, 
doing it different. And I think one of the things that's gonna emerge as the winner of that era is intuition. I think we have over pushed people to not trust their intuition. You know, that, you know, like that it, you're taught that that's wrong. And I think we're animals. And I think intuition's probably the smartest thing we got. Now you have to be careful that's not delusion and you're making pretend it's intuition. You're just, you know, yes. and so self awareness. But I, I will say that fear and intuition are two things I think about a lot. And I think that people really need to get a relationship with fear. Who are you scared of with that? You know, it's funny when you said to me, I don't like to smell my own shit. I, I always say, never get high in your own supply, right? right yeah. the, the, you know, not the metaphoric way. I easily deal with people booing and disliking me because when I get accolades, I don't hear that either. I'm just an athlete on the field. Cheering and booing is irrelevant. I've got to play. And so, you know, I like that you don't, you know, your humility is extremely attractive. I know it to be true. I think whatever energy you have around that, you need to find the same version around fear because they're actually very similar in a lot of ways. It's about the idea of whose judgment you're worried about if you lose. Hmm. Yeah, so, it's interesting, Rich. If you can figure out who. I figured it out for me early on and then worked at it. The only people I really, really needed to have a relationship in my mind about that with was my two parents. But very quickly, in my early 20s, had that combo with me of like, I'm not gonna live my life for their pre-judgment. I'll wait for their post-judgment to the results. So what, what do you say, Gary, to someone who is maybe our age, a little older, early 50s, pandemic has just absolutely turned their lives upside down and they want to just try and hit the restart button? I mean, what, what would you Two say things. to somebody like that? I start that? with gratitude. I say, if you're 50, then that means you probably know somebody who's been taken because of COVID. Because your parents, friends, your, God forbid somebody, I mean, if you're somebody who's, God forbid, had a close one go through this, well then, deploy gratitude. Thank God you're on earth. Two, perspective of time. Rich, people's relationship with time is really fucked up. I have a lot of friends who are 50, 52, 57, 63. They'll say things, ah, Gary, you're, I'm, a, I'm like, what do you mean, ah, you're, you're fucking 63. You, there's a strong chance you've got 30 more. I'm like, you remember when you were 33? They're like, yeah, but it was a trillion years ago. I'm like, good, from that moment to right now, is the amount of time you've probably still got on earth. You got a ton of shit to do. The fuck are we packing up for, right? right? And so what I would say is two things. Be, if you deploy gratitude and patience, which is a brain fuck rich for people in their late 40s and 50s and 60s. They're like, what do you mean patience? Because they grew up in this society where at like 22, get a job, by 30, get married, chill. You know this, Rich. Like, yep. Luckily for the kids now, they're pushing these numbers because they're living longer. But do you remember like what we thought about 40 looked like when we were 22? Like, you know, you're finished. That's right, I know. You know, right. and now I'm like, fuck, I'm 45 and I feel younger. I'm, I feel like I'm cooler and younger now than I was when I was 18. And so <laughs> I, think that, um, I think that I would say perspective around gratitude and patience and then asking real questions. What, why, what, why? Why do you want to do what you want to do? What do you want to do? Do you understand, can you, how? You know, like one thing that blows my mind is people willing to live in a house that's way too big because their self-esteem is wrapped up in their address instead of selling that home, moving into a condo, getting back a bunch of money so that they can take the risk to start their auto body shop or their stamp collecting or their new podcast. People are very funny. They live in the rules. Who's, you know, why are you not allowed to downsize your house and live more humbly? Why can't you trade in your Lexus for something more humble? Like, people are stuck on rules. Like, maybe you don't have to go to the Four Seasons every time. Maybe you don't fly first class. If you want to be happy, you may have to give up some luxuries or some ego to put yourself in a position of happiness. I believe that people's over respect for outside validation is the single reason of unhappiness.
Many of the guests I'll be interviewing on this show are authors of some of the most profound books ever written. Just a couple episodes we had one on, too. I love to read, but sometimes I prefer listening to books on Audible. So do my kids. At Audible, you can find the largest selection of audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, languages, business, motivation, and thousands of popular and binge-worthy podcasts. Audible is great because with their membership, you can listen offline from anywhere with a tablet or smartphone with the free Audible app. You can even listen across devices without losing your spot. The new Plus catalog makes Audible membership so much more valuable and gives all members a chance to listen to and discover new favorites and new formats like the exclusive Words and Music series or a podcast you've never dis- like the exclusive Words and Music series or a podcast you've never considered before. To get started, visit audible.com slash eisen or text EISEN to 500-500. My wife might actually do that. Again, we love listening to books on Audible in the Eisen household. I think we can all agree that running to the store has been pretty stressful lately. And there's nothing worse than forgetting something on your list and needing to make multiple trips. Shopping for home essentials should be easy and convenient. I think we can all agree. And that's where Grove Collaborative comes in. Grove is the online marketplace that delivers healthy home, beauty, and personal care products directly to you. With Grove, you don't have to shop multiple stores or search endlessly online to get all the natural goods you need for you and your family. Plus, shipping is fast and free on your first order. So join over 2 million households who have trusted Grove Collaborative to make their homes happier and healthier. Again, making the switch to natural products has never been easier. For a limited time, when my listeners go to grove.co slash eisen, you'll get to choose a free gift with your first order of $30 or more. But you have to use our special code. Go to grove.co slash eisen to get your exclusive offer. That's grove.co slash eisen. Now back to my conversation with Gary Vaynerchuk. So in the few minutes I have left with you, Gary Vaynerchuk, let's talk about the next big thing that you you see. Uh, I put a video out um, on my Twitter feed a few days ago, your appearance in April of 2019 on my show. And uh, I, I, I put in the copy of the tweet, it's like a Ruthian called shot about <laughs> trading cards, sports, sports trading cards. You're like, it's, it's going to come back. And the, the reason why you said was that the, the sneaker trading market has only a certain amount of inventory. It's not only, and you know, there's more cards to, and there are people our age that will miss that. And there's a nostalgic aspect to it. And also gambling, uh, exactly. technology, the, the internet. So you saw that thing and, and, and you did say at the end of, uh, at the end of the segment that you wanted to put it out there on my show, which I always appreciate. So you could look back three years from now <laughs> and say you were right. And we're looking back barely, barely less than two years in your right. So what do you see right now is the next big thing? Yeah. NFTs. It is. Yeah, it is. And I know people have, you know, people have probably at this point heard it once or twice. You've probably heard about people's art selling for $69 million at, at Christie's. Let me tell you why and let me explain it in a way that I think can help a lot of people who are listening. The macro technology, Rich, is game changing. It's super game changing. Uh, non fungible token, the digital tokenization of something that proves who bought it. People always struggle with that. They're like, wait a minute, why do I want to buy a JPEG? I'm like, the same reason your kids are buying $100 worth of Fortnite skins, the same reason 2K and Madden are selling virtual packs to upgrade the players, the same reason that people want a blue check on Twitter and Instagram to be verified. It's called social currency. It has always existed, it will always exist. And as we become more digital, I predict you know, I remember making this prediction with my friends back in the day, and I think it was 1997. I've been saying it's 1999, but we were already, we were actually still in school. So it was 97, actually, now that I look back, maybe 98. And I said, guys, I think everyone's gonna online date. And my friends made fun of me, Rich, like you could not believe. Because at that point, online dating was reserved for a 400 pound guy in his mom's basement, creepy, he might, kidnap you, it was very off the reservation. And you probably remember online dating in that era. But what I realized was, oh, nobody understands that this is now forever and as this becomes more normalized, and sure enough. And so what I can tell you right now, Rich, is the majority of people listening to this podcast don't realize that in nine years, 12 years, 
seven years, they will meet somebody at a cocktail party and instead of going to Instagram or Google and looking up that person, they are gonna go to that person's public wallet and they're gonna see which tokens and NFTs they bought and when. And Rich, what is gonna happen? It's not gonna be just like going to somebody's house and seeing fancy Picassos and Schmacassos, but there will be some of that like, oh shit, Rich Eisen owns this and you know, there'll be some of that for sure because that's society. But there's gonna be something else. We meet, actually, let's use us. Well, obviously we knew of each other. I've been a long, long time fan given my sports love. We meet for breakfast. We're doing our pleasantries, we have our meetings, but then you know, coffee comes and last 12 minutes, I pull out my phone and I look at your, I'm like, Eisen, what's your wallet? You're like, oh, it's at Rich Eisen. So it's gonna be like that. There's, mm-hmm. you know, it's Eisen.eth or whatever the protocols and rules of the game will be. And I'm just gonna scroll and be like, oh, bro, I got that Namath token too. And we'll have that, but then I'll be like, wait, Rich, you, holy fuck. You went to the Dave Matthews concert in Delaware in 1997? I was there. Mm -hmm. You've been failing. And because the ticket to that concert will be a token. uh, Or it will say like XYZ or you bought this book. Like it's going to show the digitalization of all our commerce activities. And so which, you know, which concerts you went to, which Super Bowls you went to. You might say, Gary. I knew you were a Jets fan. I cannot believe you actually sat through the whole Monday Night Miracle because I'm making pretend this is 50 years in advance. Because right. when I was in the Monday Night Miracle, Rich, and AJ and I will tell you this, there was 4,000 people left at the end. I've met 80,000 people personally who claim they were there. <laughs> but what will happen in the future, Rich, is not only will the ticket that I use to get in the game be on my tokenized wallet and it'll show and I'll display it digitally, but the Jets will probably create a scanner at the end of that game that I can scan that prove that I stayed all the way through and on the blockchain, never being able to be touched by anybody, there's complete digital proof that I stayed to the end. And that will be cool for our relationship. You'll be like, Gary, I can't believe you stayed the whole, like, and there'll be these kind of tokens that are social tokens, access tokens. I'll see that, oh, you belong to the Soho Club too? Because I'll see your Soho Club token there. Be like, hey, let's have our next dinner. To so- it's going to talk for us the same way pictures talk for us now. It's a major technology. Now, comma, this is huge, big point. I believed in the internet the most in 96, 7, 8, 9, and I yelled from the top of the mountains. But when my friends started buying stock in 98 and 99, because they had a couple bucks, I'm like, guys, you know, I'm, you know, they're like, Gary, I'm doing this. Like you told me, I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, I told you the internet's big. I didn't tell you pets.com and eToys are worth $500 a share. I'm like, these companies don't make money. They're, you know, I'm in the winelibrary.com business yet. There's still a lot of people that don't know how to use the internet. Right. Like not everybody's buying. I think they might be overpriced. And sure enough, as you probably remember, March, April of 2000, all the internet stocks went to zero, but eBay was there, Amazon was there for five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever it went down to. And that's what's gonna happen, Rich, with all these NFT projects. You know, NFTs are gonna be something you will be talking about to the rest of your life. NBA Top Shot, CryptoPunks, Chubbies, these projects, you know, uh, CryptoKitties, you know, uh, the the Moon Cats, uh, and then Pokemon, you know, Waxio's Garbage Pail Kids, the NFL's gonna have their NBA Top Shop. UFC's already announced that they have their NBA Top Shop with Flo and those guys. The, the, the NHL, uh, soccer, and then the human individuals, we've already seen it from Gronkowski and Patrick Mahomes. Like, I, listen, even though he's a pat, he, at this point he's a buccaneer, I like a good Gronk laugh as much as the next guy. And I'm really proud of Gronk for moving first, but it's gonna be very unlikely that the value that those Gronk NFTs went for are gonna stay. Here's why, Rich, the supply. The amount of NFTs that are gonna come out, you're gonna have an NFT for your race. You know, like, like, you just, everything's gonna be NFT, so there's gonna be, it's gonna be like this. In 1994, it was a novelty to have a website. People are like, whoa, you have a website? Right. Now, it's just like oxygen. The same thing will happen with NFTs. Everything will have NFTs in 20 years. The key now is to not get too caught up in the gold rush, the Beanie Baby moment, and just start investing in shit. A lot of it will go down. I believe CryptoPunks, since it was the first NFT project on Ethereum, it's got this legendary status. I think that one goes crazy long term. 
But do I think over a big correction in a year or two or six months that that could even drag down? It could and then bounce back up like Amazon. So that's the macro of it. And when it all comes down to it, though, I think some many people are kind of turned off by it because they don't think they can afford it. You know, the prices that yeah, you're me, hearing, me, they're, they're yeah, astronomical. Me, meanwhile, yeah. meanwhile, yes, you're, every, but everyone's looking at very small things. That's like saying, well, I can't be an influencer because Charlie D'Amelio has 100 million TikTokers. Well, of course you can. 80,000 followers on your honey business could be meaningful. Right. You can't buy a Beeple for 69 million, but I'm just looking right now. I, I want to actually give him a shout out. I'm just about to buy one from, from Buddha Ben. I'm literally doing it right now. Literally, he, like I'm about to buy, it's 0.001 ETH. It's like f- nothing. It's like a couple, it's $100 if that. Like, like you know, there's gonna be, there's gonna be plenty of bargains. The problem is right this second as of recording, 99% of things are gonna be overpriced because we're in that early. The beanie baby mm-hmm. stage, as you say. Gary, you're the man. Love Thank you, you brother. I really, you uh, no, I do consider you, uh, you know, and honestly, just going back full circle to that conversation we had in Dallas. I, I you know, I'm always honest with, with my uh, listeners, viewers, guests as well. Literally 10 minutes after you were telling me about, you know, I've got a mortgage and I've got kids and, you know, people like me don't usually take this risk, but you should. I really was sitting there and said, who the hell does this guy think he is? And then by the end of, by the end of breakfast, I was like, okay. And then I'm going to my car and I'm like, wait a minute. This actually was Makes sense. not only made sense, but I appreciated the way you actually put it. And mm-hmm. then obviously in the, in the ensuing years, I thought to myself, that is like gold, you know, what to get advice from you. Uh, I know Thank there's you. many people in my industry for sure that, that reach out to you for it. And Thank you. so many other people do. So for you to actually, you know, come on this pod and, Help, uh, help me brand it and give those two cents to people who need it. I really appreciate it, Gary. Really. I adore you, your class act. Thank you for having me. Right back at you. That's Gary Vaynerchuk right here on Just Getting Started. Yes, sir. That's Gary Vaynerchuk right here on this pod. And when he said that age 21 to age 27 is the sweet spot to try something new and go for it, and risk it because you will sleep on a friend's couch. You can go somewhere and follow a dream and try your best to make ends meet, but you also don't have the things that you might have in real life. I don't want to say weighing you down since I am somebody with kids and a wife and a mortgage, but I think you understand what I'm saying is that when you are free of responsibility to others and also maybe a bank that's loaned you money. If you're free from those responsibilities, go for it. That's why I also wanted to ask about uh, an older age group in their 40s and 50s and 60s, if somebody has to try something new, just get started on something new, his advice for that. But when I was age 21 through 27, that's when I I went for it. I mean, I told a story earlier um, in in the uh, podcast, previous episodes about having an epiphany behind the wheel of a car chasing an ambulance, literally chasing an ambulance while on a uh, filling in for a reporter on the police beat for my local newspaper, the Staten Island Advance, or as we said in Staten Island, the Advance, putting the syllable on the, the accent on the first syllable. But um, I, I had an epiphany there, and I was age 21 through 24. I just said, you know what, screw it, I'm going to go for it here. And I went back to graduate school. I got deeper into debt, which is another thing that Gary talked about, that you know, college might not be uh, proper for some because getting so deep into debt to go to college might not be the right path for people. But I, I you know, took more student loans out, and I was still having to pay off student loans to my, you know, the University of Michigan. And I decided I'm going to go for it. I'm going to try and get a graduate degree and get a tape together and go anywhere I had to go to just get started on my career. And I, I looked in upstate New York because I'm from Staten Island, New York, for my first job and, um, you know, crashed on some couches and definitely um, crashed on some couches at Northwestern because the last part of the um, the seminar was in the last part of the uh, of the year that I was there at Northwestern was in Washington, D.C. I crashed on some couches there. 
And um, I went to Redding, California and to get my start for six seventy an hour, which is what I think I told Harlan Coben in the previous episodes that that's what my hourly wage was six seventy six seventy five an hour and um went to Redding, California, got my start there, and it was a total out of body experience. I'm from Staten Island, New York, the home. Uh, of the world's largest landfill that's now been closed. So the mountains I grew up around were made of garbage, literally. And now here I am in Redding, California, surrounded by actual mountains. If anybody's ever seen the TV show Northern Exposure, you know, with the Jewish guy in the forest, um, that was me um, in, in Redding, California. And I just went for it. I went there. I wasn't making much money. I certainly wasn't being able to pay off my student loans very well. But I just rolled the dice and I just said, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to go to a spot where I feel like a fish out of water and try and make myself the, the biggest fish in that pond and send a tape to a headhunter. Cost me first class postage. That's all it cost. Sent it to a, a, a three news and sports, um, television news and television sports headhunters. And ESPN found my tape. And the rest is literally history. So when Gary's like, you know, when you're 21, you're 27, if you're somebody who, who doesn't have um, much uh, on the responsibility scale for yourself, go for it. I totally agree with Gary. That's what I did. And I want to thank everybody for listening to this edition of Just Getting Started right here on Westwood One. We'll see you next week. <laughs>